Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today's uh, UFMRM webinar. So today we have Martin Dolan from Aquabank and Oxford Brook University. Also, his colleague uh, John Alexander. They recently are working on this project, I React, and develop some interesting applications. So we are very keen to learn about this. So now the floor is yours, Martin. Okay, thank you, Albert. Um, my name is Martin Dolan. I work for Aquabex and Aquabex Technologies Limited. Aquabex Technologies is a spin-off or a sister company of Aquabex Flood Solutions, um, and it is a company that is based around the technological um, aspects of flood risk management, such as early warning systems. And today, I'm going to be running through iReact project uh, and product that we've been um, involved in the development of which is being launched this year or sorry well 2019 officially but um, I'm also here with John Alexander the director of, of Aquabex and Aquabex Technologies and he's going to run through a little bit of the technical side of things so I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview. iReact is the first modular solution to integrate and analyze in real time a set of data coming from different sources to provide an action-based warning system. Um, iReact is for citizens, responders, decision makers who are politicians, flood risk managers, and also for businesses. Um, the unique aspects of iReact are its real-time um, warnings and the fact that those warnings are action based so citizens and responders know what to do. So this is based on a, a recognition that you know when we've spoken to um, decision makers, responders and citizens they've told us that they don't want to just be scared they want to know what to do in a situation. Um, the challenge, as we all know, is the increasing um, risk of disasters driven by climate change. We're seeing increasing storms, floods, droughts, um, fires, wildfires, um, pretty much everywhere. Um, this is increasing the risk to, to people with growing urbanization. We're getting more vulnerabilities. Um, the challenges that we've seen um, when it comes to early warning systems that can provide warnings in the face of emergencies are that there are often multiple hazards at any one time with multiple agencies working together in response. And that can be across national or regional boundaries um, where you need a, a joined up effort. Um, also, we've seen that timeliness is an issue. So we need live feeds or live understanding of what's happening on the ground in real time. And there seems to be quite a lot of difficulty around citizen engagement, that is um, teaching people prior to an emergency what they should do in an emergency and then when an emergency occurs also being able to send out um, detailed messages to them so they know what to do and when to do it. Existing early warning systems um, don't necessarily meet all of these challenges uh, or they partly do. Um, in terms of timeliness, the lead-in times can be quite a, a, a critical factor for protecting citizens and, and infrastructure. Um, building awareness and action, often that aspect can fail in, in, in existing um, early warning systems. And the fact that the data needed to provide all of this, a timely and action-driven warning, the amount of data is often disparate. It's collected in different ways by different agencies um, in different formats and it can be quite a chore to process that data. So iReact was born as a response to these challenges and difficulties. Um, it is a project or was a project funded by the European Commission um, to a value of 6.3 million euros. It involved 20 partners across three countries. And you can see here um, just the sort of selection of some of those partners, not all of them. Um, 
And Aquabex was brought into the project as a commercial partner that has experience within the flood risk management field because the EU recognized that they didn't want to just develop an early warning system. They wanted to develop um, something that would be actually rolled out and implemented, um, not just in Europe, but across the globe. Uh, so Aquabex is now charged with um, commercializing this, getting it into the hands of the people that need it, the, the emergency responders, governments and businesses. And that's where we are now. We're coming towards the end of that three year project and getting ready to commercialize it. So iReact draws data from satellites, weather forecasts, and we can take data from drones and historical data, uh, integrates all of this and is able to provide a, an action-based warning system. Some of the unique features of iReact are its social media service. So this is um, a modular um, aspect core service of iReact that differentiates it from other early warning systems as in, in it draws data from social media so that it can understand in real time what's going on on the ground. Um, it does that by analyzing tweets for keywords and it can geolocate those tweets anonymously so that um, we can see, we can integrate that with historical data and, and flood risk maps as well as other maps. This is not just for flooding, it's for multiple hazards. Um, another key service of iReact is its ability to report to citizens directly so that they can get um, updated alerts and warnings that are action-based. And it is essentially an, uh, an emergency management service. Um, so there are, this provides warnings and actions to the emergency responders. Um, they can also feed information back into the system and it helps to prove, to prove the safety of operators and their, their uh, effectiveness in the field. So the way iReact works is through uh, a complex architecture. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to John Alexander, who's going to run you through this a little bit. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, so one of the things you'll, you'll see with the um, the chart that I've just moved on from um, is that it's a very much a modular system. We do realize that we're a little bit late to the game here now, but we are looking to, to um, bring to market the next generation of early warning systems. And for that matter, we need to make it plug and play. So what, what we can do when we go to places that haven't got early warning systems is to provide everything for them. So everything in, includes data, the aggregator and the dissemination device, or we can just add value to what's already existing in uh, in the marketplace. So if you look at the structure on here, on the, the top orange box is your web front end, so that's your visualization within the uh, control center. And on the right hand side, you'll see things like mobile app and wearables. And these are more uh, for the field staff and for citizens, mobile app, comes in a free version uh, for citizens uh, and a professional version for, for professional users, first responders, uh, business owners as well. We're able to integrate into most sensor networks that are out in, in, in the network. We have a, a service bus and a, and a LEMS development so that we can look at uh, analog signals coming from river and sea gauges. Uh, we can also, as you see on the left, take data from satellite feeds um, f f for um, Copernicus and, and other uh, systems, Galileo and Sentinel. And as Mar Martin referred to, it's multi-hazard. So we also have access to, to both the fire and flood uh, nowcast and forecasts that, that come in from, from those, those uh, services across Europe. We can add to that by bringing in uh, Hydromet data, so we, we uh, integrate to the local weather services. We have um, partners that can deliver climate and seasonal change models, and we can bring in various risk models, both on on flooding and on fire. One of the one of the important things to notice about the drone technology today is it's very useful for getting historical data back in. So you can see burn areas from past fires, you can see flood areas from past floods. 
And we can bring that in through our historical data and bring those in and improve on the risk models. The data lake at the bottom is, is quite unique uh, in that we're able to use, as, as Martin referred to, a lot of disparate um, agencies with their different database sources, rather than try to, to get people to share that data, which they always find difficult to do. We can anon anonymously stream from those databases, use the relevant data for up updating the, uh, the field staff, and then in essence, give it back without really um, changing any, any issues around it. Social media aspect is very key, uh, as Martin said, and this is really a push and a pull application. So we're pushing alerts out to the, the citizens that have got those. But importantly, we're actually taking information from them. These, these will be real life at the scene of disaster information coming in. And through a series of gamification tools that's in here as well, we'll be able to know whether we can trust those, those tweets or not. So these, these modules, as you see on here, are very easy to plug into existing systems. So we don't have to go in and, uh, and ruin any investments that's happened previously. Okay. I think I've broken it. Yeah. Do you want to run this? So this this again just highlights in graphical format how how that would work. So the the I reactor is the bit that does all the aggregation uh, work in the middle. That's the cloud based version that we've seen in there. We do do very much see this as a as a cloud based solution, so that we can offer this across multi agencies and and multiple nationalities. As as you know river courses do not uh, respect uh, international boundaries. And this is a very good way that we can actually get different uh, agencies talking to each other. Uh, you can see a, a brief picture on top right of what the, the, the information would look like on the, um, the control center screen. And you'll see the geolocation tweets that be coming up there. And you can actually show the photos that have been sent in from those, those tweets. Okay. Um, some of the built around the early warning system, there are also some extra uh, um, technologies that we're, we're developing, such as augmented reality glasses, uh, wearables for first responders that can monitor their location, their heart rate, temperatures in fire, um, and certain other aspects as well. These will feed back data into the system and also help emergency responders to, to respond better. The app um, is key for the citizen engagement aspect. So the citizens themselves are often the first people to the scene of, a, of an emergency and they can sort of submit um, reports. Those reports are verified through a sort of gamification um, strategy whereby the more reports you submit, the more your user profile becomes verified and your rating increases. Um, through tweets and um, reports from the app, these are geolocalized and integrated into the, 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 the report system. And uh, both, both citizens and responders can access that. So this sort of outlines the gamification process where a user can start out as a rookie um, through answering quizzes, playing games, sending different reports, doing lessons. They can progress from a rookie or through all the stages up to an iReactor. Um, they get rewards such as, the, as access to different maps, um, mysterious content, etc. This is the sort of build engagement when there is no emergency and when we, we, it's been noted that actually that's probably the most difficult time to, to build awareness around the risks. Um, on this slide, there is an embedded video. So if you just click on the play button, you'll be able to watch a video which um, takes you through um, aspects of the app. And I'll just give you, it's only a minute long, so I'll give you about a minute and 10 seconds to play that video and then I'll, I'll start talking again.
Okay, so that the video should be finished now, so I'll, I'll move on to the next next slide. Um, this just shows some of the uh, wearables that have been developed as the uh, as side technologies within the system that are Google, the, sorry, augmented reality glasses and uh, wearables for fire or um, emergency services. Um, in developing the project, we have done trials and pilot projects in Piedmonte in Italy with the emergency services there, in uh, Norwich in the UK, and in January we're going to be starting um, our first real implementation of the system in Vila, Denmark, where the municipality there have contracted us to carry out um, or yeah, it, it provide them with an early warning system for flooding. Um, so we're going to be implementing the iReact um, citizen app, the social media um, integrator, and analyzing some of their existing structures and, and alert systems so that we can upgrade them. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can also see some of the different municipalities uh, around Europe that have been involved in the development of this project. And ultimately what iReact offers is increased performance for emergency responders, uh, more engaged citizens, and reduced costs in terms of emergency response and also in terms of the damages resulting from emergencies. Um, the iReact app was released on World Resilience Day in 13th, on the 13th of October and is free to download. That was on Android. I has the yeah, Apple. January. January. The Apple Store will uh, have it available for download on Apple devices in January. Um, so feel free to go on, download it, give it a try. Um, the more people we can get involved in this, the, the better the, the system will be. So that is um, that is it from us. That's the iReact system, um, and we'll move on to taking some questions now. Okay, thank you very much, John and Martin. So, any question from our audience? Uh, may I ask something? Yes, please. All right. Uh, I'm a colleague of Alberts from uh, uh, the University of Exeter. We are next door to each other, our offices, and we have worked together in a lot of projects. So first, I wanted to congratulate you because uh, when I first saw, I mean, the notification of uh, the app on the 13th of October, uh, which came, you know, as an email alert, I was green with envy. I mean, I would want to be in such a thing. So I really congratulate you because I think it's brilliant. Hmm. Uh, so thank you. One thing, uh, a few things to ask. First, um, you mentioned something about augmented reality. Yeah. And um, I was wondering because um, you have um, uh, introduced augmented reality for the uh, first responders. I understand, not for the public. Yeah. So, what type of uh, uh, thing uh, or what approach you had for augmented reality there? I mean, how it were, I mean, the concept, I mean, I know what augmented reality is, but I don't know how you introduced it in the whole concept of a react. Okay, so it is for first responders, so the, the guys that's in the field, and it's a way of sending that visual uh, image that the first responders have directly back into the control center. So in essence, we're putting the control center staff in the field so that they can they can see exactly what is going on and what their people are facing. Oh, so it's just for them to uh, take a visual image and send it back to the center so that it can be implemented in the whole uh, system. It is at this stage, yeah, yeah. We've got plans to to take that further, further afield so that we can actually uh, integrate risk models over that as well. So you can actually see potentially where the, the flood or the fire event might be spreading to so that you can, through that augmented reality, take actions on on those sort of things but at, at launch day is just so that we've got a visual path from the field to the control center the plan is also to be able to give um, action-based um, 
warnings to to the emergency responders too so if they're in a burning building for example they're able to locate people that are trapped if there has been a report um, same in flooding situation so they can get it directly through in a visual manner hands-free so in that case they came they have the uh, information flowing from the center to the responders isn't it yeah yeah it's both it's both way as uh, push pull uh, event as, same, uh, as well all right and um, a second question has to do about modeling and um, uh, the flood modeling the mapping the flood impact I understand that you have in the background some sort of uh, computational tool, isn't it? That um, uh, estimates uh, flood propagation. Yeah, we can bring in any uh, risk models that we like. I mean, we, we're working with a company called FBK at the moment with their risk models. But the, the modularity of the system allows allows us to plug in any, any risk models. We've got a very simple, what we call an IDI, interface that allows us to, to take that model and map it into our back end uh, fairly seamlessly. It's, a, it's a quite, a, quite an easy implementation. So we won't be restricted on the, the data sources coming into the, uh, the system. Right. So this uh, flood uh, model tool, whatever it is, it's, um, uh, it is uh, updated at real time or near real time with uh, uh, coming info it is yeah and at that that risk model uh, also feeds into the now casting feature so we we combine the the risk model with the weather uh, observations and we can turn that into a now cast so that people get up to the date within the hour models of what's happening on the ground and predictions of what might happen in the following hours all right and um, uh, okay, and uh, you didn't have any uh, issues with the uh, um, computational time needed in the background for this flood propagation. Not for those models. We do obviously with uh, with satellite data because the processing time is is quite large. So um, those that tends to be on a on a, a longer time frame. But with the other computational models, no, we are able to update those on an hourly basis. Good. Thank you. Okay. We also have question from Naila, and this on the conversation. Will Martin and John you be able to read them? Um, let me see. Okay. Yes. Let me just read it. Yeah. The first question is how the app or algorithm behind filters the citizen data in order to precise and not just noise in the forecast now cast? Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, that's, that's taken off a lot of our time within the app. So gamification is one way that we, we strip out um, fake news so that we are qualifying the tweets through the gamification process as as Martin showed you where you, you we promote them from from being a novice to a guru by doing tips and quizzes with them and verifying whether they've promoted good reports or bad reports. The other thing is the um, artificial uh, intelligence and, and a language assessment within the program. So we are able to, to look at the keywords within, within the message that's coming through and tag them as being uh, relevant or relevant, relevant. So we can search on keywords like fire and flood and, and earthquake. Um, but it's a continually learning process because, <coughs> because within obviously within the English language you get terms like floods of tears and, and floods of responses and the, the, the algorithms are, are intelligent enough that we can actually take those phrases out. The other, the other learning phrase that it has to go through again, I think because of the, um, the English language you'll probably find that place names are the same around the world. And there's a London in England and there's a London in Toronto, for example. And again, through through testing and through learning algorithms, we can actually verify those geolocation sites are, are giving the person any information that we're looking for. Hopefully that answers point one. 
the second yeah. question by giving points and levels for participating aren't you promoting citizens to get exposed to hazards no we're not because um the instructions are very clear is that you know do not put yourself in in harm's way so that we're not asking people to go and stand in, in flood water to promote uh and show how the uh, the flood depths are there but we are people will be at the scene of the event and we are asking them to to report on what we see, but we're absolutely not encouraging people to put themselves in harm's way. And as it's configured now, can the user get warning information directly to the app without the official warning? No, this will tie into, uh, for the citizen app, it will tie into the local authorities' uh, applications. So for in, in the UK, for example, we tie in with the Environment Agency standard three uh, warning scales and we will base our, um, our warning around that. For, for organisations such as commercial and uh, critical infrastructure, we will have separate um, I do, I, ways of communicating with them, uh, but that will be through the web front end. So, for example, they could map all of their assets onto uh, geographically onto a map, and they could see, using the flood modelling and other alerts, they could see when their assets are at risk. So that would be a different way of communicating with those uh, structural organizations. Thank you. Very good. Is there any other questions? Uh, may I ask one more, please? Yes, please. I was inspired. So, uh, I was uh, uh, the the question, the second question you had from the from Nyla, uh, the giving points and levels for participating, promoting citizens to get exposed to hazards. I want to ask something further because we had been looking into it for another matter. Uh, how do you distinguish between citizens that are under 18 and citizens over 18? I mean, do you have some sort because uh, children might play with it or might uh, download it and use it. So you have some sort of uh, uh, threshold where information is acceptable and information is not acceptable. That's a really good question, Lydia, and mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I will take that away and we will come back to you on that. Okay, All right, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. If uh, May I ask oh, two questions? I'm very interested about your, uh, your work. We're well, very uh, interested, yes, really. I'm saying yeah. it again, it's uh, an excellent work. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lydia. So, for this uh, citizen uh, engagement, the information is tracked from the tweet. So, you have the text information and also have the image. So, do you have any further algorithm to process the image to extract more data instead of just the location, but also the intensity or scale of the, the hazard? We, we do, within the reporting structure, have a, a template in there where we ask people to fill in data for us. So, for example, they can estimate the speed of the flow and the depth of the water in, in that. And, you know, in the case of fire, give us some ideas of where they think the wind direction is and that sort of thing. That's within the report template. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Albert's question was about it's Twitter. Not, it's not actually embedded in the tweet at the moment, but I can't see why we wouldn't actually be able to merge those two together. Do you, do you, Albert, do you know of any technologies out there that are capable of doing that? We are looking for to develop some new technology, try to uh, do this kind of image recognition, try to extract the information directly from the image or video. So instead of asking the participant to input, to put in additional information, we can just simply process the, the image or video to get additional data from that part. Yeah, that might be what Gunther is talking to me about. That's yeah. something that we definitely would be interested in integrating into the system, yeah. Yeah, and the other question is that, so this platform, is that kind of, do you offer kind of API or plugin to allow the other who hasn't been involved in this project but could contribute later to iReact? Yeah, absolutely. We see this as a as a really open platform. I mean, one of the things that we're we're looking at is to is to make this all encompassing. Um, at the moment, we're just looking at fire, floods, and extreme weather events. But yeah, we're already talking to people. For example, they've got a smoke detection 
uh, system and algorithms. They can detect smoke at uh, five kilometers distance. We know of other applications where they can see lightning strikes out at sea uh, within storm clouds. So, yeah, we are looking to really to to adapt and bring all, as many algorithms and data streams that we can to actually make the forecasting and the um, the dissemination of that as accurate as possible. Have you got any anything in mind about how you might contribute? Yes, we yes. we have developed a series of models that we can try to uh, link. We are thinking that we probably can contribute to the to the flood mapping uh, modeling or also the impact uh, risk assessment. So there could be different ways for plugging our uh, work in in the I React for the future. Yeah, yeah, that would be very useful. Agree with Albert, uh, we have um, uh, we would like to be involved in this. Uh, we have uh, we have things which we can contribute, which are on the mapping, on the uh, flooding, on the simulation. I mean, the computational side of the flooding and other things also. Yeah, that would be very useful. And are you, are you doing that as um, generic models, or are you doing that on specific um, basins and uh, river courses? It's generic approach, so we should be able to apply our model to us to different uh, catchment, different basin. And is that 2D or 3D? Uh, 2D. 2D, okay. I, I believe you do um, drainage models too for surface water flooding yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Very useful, very useful. Okay. Is um, fast flood modeling, which is, um, uh, it improves the um, processing time for computational side uh, while maintaining a high level of accuracy. Uh, when it comes to estimation of the flood propagation and uh, uh, taking into account the buildings, thresholds and such things. We have done some work on it. Uh, so we are really interested in um, linking with you. And a further one, which, uh, sorry to, I know we're past the time, but uh, I can't, can't ex escape me to ask you. <laughs> have you heard, um, first, a small history. Yesterday we won uh, an EU uh, H2020 project uh, with Albert, uh, well which is um, about uh, uh, the fiber platform, which we may have heard or not, I don't know, uh, which is uh, an EU platform for data exchange and protocols and enablers for all types of data, which should, should, is uh, being slowly populated with communication, energy and other types of data, not for the water. So we want a project populated with uh, water enablers. And um, uh, the theory is that FIWA would provide the platform for data exchange across Europe, all types of data. So I was wondering whether you have looked into it, whether the data protocols you have um, are compatible with uh, FIWA, which is uh, open source, of course, and um, uh, is to be populated as we uh, speak for every year. No, we, I've never heard of the Fiber platform. Fiber, F-I-B-R-E. Uh, Fiber, F-I-W-A-R-E. Okay. Okay. Uh, certainly look into it, yeah. Well, um, another thing we could, because this will start now in a few months and we've got, um, um, we're looking into uh, different types of um, uh, applications in the water sector that might be compatible or not with uh, fiber and how they can be compatible or further. Uh, I mean, it's long term survival what I'm talking about. I mean, in order to expand and be compatible and be able to talk to uh, or exchange, uh, you know, information for different databases, systems, sensors, call it whatever you wish. So it's another aspect that we would like to uh, collaborate with you. I mean, uh, even through Fiverr, we're going to have some sort of, uh, say, hackathons and events where people from SMEs would be invited to uh, participate in uh, sort of uh, uh, furthering their application, whatever that is, through Fiverr with support. Okay. Okay, so we'll be interested in, in picking that up. Yeah. I think we have passed the time, so it's yes. very interesting. We'll we might want to continue the discussion offline. But thanks again for 
Martin and Jung for your interesting talk. It's very useful for us, and we are looking forward to hearing more information from iRec React in the future. My email is in the slides on the first slide, so if you share the slides with everybody, and thank you. Yes, we there. Yeah, thanks yeah. for your talk, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.